thank you all for coming to this session, Religious Tolerance, Can We Keep the Faith? My name's Angus Kennedy. I'm the convener of the Institute of Ideas Summer Academy. Just something to frame this discussion we're about, about to have on religious tolerance. Let me read to you a paragraph from Sunday Times. The British Prime Minister tomorrow will publish plans to create a blacklist of radicals and extremist groups subject to banning orders. The context of this deeply sinister news is web ban on hate preachers. Radicals and extremists uh, preaching hateful uh, religious ideology will be uh, subject to bans of the use of online media. There will be extremism checks carried out in workplaces. People found to have extremist views will be banned from working with children. So this is the context in which we're going to discuss religious tolerance. I suppose the question really is, uh, to what extent can we continue to extend uh, religious freedom in a 21st century secular society? So my panel, in the order that they're going to uh, make their introductions, uh, on my right, Humera Iktida, a senior lecturer in politics at the Department of Political Economy at King's College, London. After Homera, on my far right, uh, Leszek Jezewski, the editor-in-chief of the Polish liberal journal Liberté. After Leszek, Dolan Cummings, on my immediate right, Dolan's an associate fellow of the Institute of Ideas, editor of a good book, Debating Humanism, and the co-founder of the Civil Liberties Group, the Manifesto Club. After Dolan, uh, we'll hear from Eliza Philby, on my far left. Eliza's a lecturer in modern British history, also at King's College London, and author of a book with a rather fabulous title, God and Mrs. Thatcher, which is you know, a match made in heaven. <laughs> the battle for Britain's soul. And last to speak is Father Christopher Jameson, on my immediate uh, left. Uh, it's Benedictine monk at Worth Abbey, the author of Finding Sanctuary and Finding Happiness, and the star, is star the right word, of the BBC TV's The Monastery. Can we all give our, our panel a big round of applause? And Humaira, would you like to get sure. us started? Thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers for the invitation, and thank you all for coming here. Angus has given us five minutes each, so um, I'm going to have to be very quick, as will everybody else. And all I can do, in a sense, is to raise some questions that we can take up for debate and discussion later on. So what I want to start with is actually the, to question um, uh, to question the whole idea of religious tolerance itself. Um, and I want us to think about why do we actually need to separate out different kinds of tolerance? Why do we need to, for instance, and obviously as soon as we say religious tolerance, uh, what is implicit in this is the contrast with secular tolerance, right? So why do we need, why do we have this need to actually separate out religious tolerance from secular tolerance, if both are going to lead to similar kinds of results, is there value to thinking separately about religious forms of tolerance to, uh, from secular forms of tolerance? What I'd like to do is to open up both religion or religious and the tolerance part of it. First, this idea that the religious affair is distinct, it is uh, something that we can very clearly chart out and map out from the rest of society, is of course a very parochial European idea. I mean, it's very linked to a particular history within Europe where uh, nowhere else in the world did we have an experience of something like the Roman Catholic Church where uh, uh, a church and an empire came together and systematically a hierarchy very systematically controlled or uh, managed aspects of the state for as long as it did. We don't have that in other parts of the world. So that there was a need to separate out religion from politics or from the state was something that was you know, deeply European and not really shared by other parts of the world. And then we have the wars of religion, etc. So there's a particular reason within the European context where religion has particular connotations, it has a certain history, and there was a need to separate out the religious from the secular. So the first point is that kind of need didn't exist in, in other religious traditions, uh, in most other religious traditions, and in other parts of the world. But that's one part. The other part that I think we need to really consider is that actually Ultimately, this attempt to separate the religious from, uh, from the non-religious, from the secular, from other parts of society, etc., 
it's a conceptual device, right? Because actually, like our attempt to separate the market from society, society from state, we can never completely separate these things out. Whether the state is an integral part of a society, whether the market is completely free of the society, etc. These are questions that have been going on uh, now for at least two centuries, partly because of the way, and certainly in the last century, this is, these are in some ways conceptual tools that we've used to understand social world around us, but these cannot be hard and fast categories. And in fact, what we have seen is a continuous process of trying to define precisely where society ends and state starts and where, you know, where is the market above society or below society, etc. And the same, so in some ways this is a, I would suggest to you, a doomed project of trying to separate the religious from the secular because the secular has no meaning by itself. The secular can only be defined in relation to the religious. We do not have a definition of secular which is without, uh, without uh, its engagement with the religious. The other thing that I want to do very quickly is to question an undiluted positive normative association with the idea of tolerance. It's an idea with a particularly European history because the paradox is that Europe went through this process of homogenizing imaginations, of erasing away diversity, and then introducing some diversity uh, later on on very limited terms. So the paradox is that Europe is today the least diverse, con the least diverse, you know, subcontinent. It's not really a continent, <laughs> and that's a that's another part aspect of our colonial hangover. Uh, but it's a re diverse region, and yet it has a very developed theory of tolerance. Whereas other parts of the world, India, what we call the subcontinent of South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, is geographically bigger than the continent of Europe, but also in terms of ethnic, linguistic, religious diversity, it's just way more diverse. So the paradox is that the rest of the world has lived and coexisted with difference for longer, whereas Europe has lived with less diversity but has a much more developed theory of tolerance. But more importantly, I mean, what this is linked to is that, as I said earlier, you know, uh, 700 years of Muslim uh, existence in Europe had to be erased out of uh, European imagination. Long-running Jewish uh, presence within Europe had to be erased out of European imagination, and then they were introduced back in on very <coughs> limited terms, and this is where the theories of toleration and tolerance we had came, came in. So I want to propose that tolerance is too fragile, too limited a concept. And what we should really be thinking about and talking about in a much more engaged manner is the question of justice, not tolerance. And hopefully with this, okay. you know, there are some questions for us to debate and discuss later on. Excellent. Thank you Thank very you. much. Lisek. Religion is uh, um, perfectly okay uh, as long as it's not treated seriously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know it might sound controversial. Uh, secular is, in, is indeed, as Humeria mentioned, a product of very specific uh, conditions that happen in Europe. And uh, one of them, which we tend to forget, looking down on the Muslims who are now having the tribal war between Shia and Sunni in the Middle East, is that it was the product of the even bloodier wars, especially the 30-year world of the 17th century and before. The religious tolerance didn't come out of the blue uh, to, to Europe. It was uh, thought of. Honestly, it, it happened only because we stopped to treat in Europe uh, religion seriously. Because if we really believe that being here is just for a brief part of the time, a way to achieve a final destination up in heaven, there is no need to uh, behave in a way not to achieve the, the final ascension to God. And that's why if we really believe that, for example, abortion is, if, for example, abortion, we think that abortion is a murder. Uh, I come from the country where abortion is almost banned. I come from Poland. Well, then, there is no need to, uh, not to shoot to the mass killers, like sometimes it happens in the United States, to the clinics that actually perform abortions. Religion treated very seriously it leads to the, to the use of force, as we see now in certain parts of Middle East, unfortunately. 
And another, another uh, thing I would like to challenge is that religion should be, tr should be treated with respect. No. It's the human beings who should be treated with respect. Human beings who have certain, of course, beliefs. But religion itself is, if you look at it from the outside, if you have the Martian landing uh, on Earth, he, he would, for him, uh, well, the, uh, our religions here, wouldn't be very much different than the associations of people who are uh, dress up as elves and dwarves and speak Quenya, the language of the elves, from the Middle Earth, from Tolkien's trilogy. It is human beings who should be treated with respect. And at the same time, religion uh, played an enormously important role in our uh, societies. Uh, for many years, we needed a kind of spiritual and carrot and stick to tell us what to do because otherwise, perhaps we would kill each other. And Ten Commandments in this part of the world are indeed written in stone, not because they are the voice of God, but because they were simply necessary product of the society which had to produce these kind of rules simply to exist. But now the humanity, uh, I mean, at least certain part, because I agree, the secularization and this kind of religious tolerance is a product of the let's say, Western civilization or, well, European civilization, whatever we want to call it. But this was the religious tolerance and, and secularism. I can quote Ivan Krastev, who was a Freedom Games, back where I'm from, in Łódź, yesterday. And he said one very important thing. We learned very well how to solve the question how, but we forgot the question why. And in, to some extent, I believe, and I think I will, uh, I will try to finish with this, that in Europe, to, to a certain extent, we tend to forget about questions, spiritual questions, which we will start to not ask ourselves anymore. And it's because we also associate it with, to a certain extent, we associate it with the, uh, with the organized religion. And not necessarily so. We can find responsibility uh, we can be responsible for ourselves. We don't need organized religions to tell us what to do anymore. We can find solutions here, not look up, uh, up for, for them in, in heaven for some uh, outer force telling us uh, how we, sh we should behave. The uh, responsibility of ours is here between each other and it's also in us to find this uh, answer to this, to this question, why we are here, why we are here for such a brief of time. Why we, why we have consciousness. And these are very important spiritual, metaphysical questions, but not necessarily the religious questions. And just to finish, uh, the, uh, there is this uh, famous Woody Allen quote that uh, uh, I believe there's something up there uh, watching us, but unfortunately it is uh, the government. <laughs> so with this optimistic <laughs> message, <laughs> thank, thank you for Thank attention. you very much, Leszek. Um, to them. Um, we've heard a bit about the European history leading to the, the, the modern idea of tolerance. Um, I want to recommend a book, a recent book by Hilary Gatti um, called Ideas of Liberty in Early Modern Europe, um, which discusses that period. I'm uh, particularly taken with her discussion of a, a 16th century Italian Protestant called Jacopo Aconcio, who wrote a book in 1565 called Satan's Stratagems. To quote Gatti, according to Aconcio, the religious disputes of his age and the ensuing oppression of heretical opinion should be understood as a subtle stratagem of Satan designed to bring out the worst human passions of hatred and contempt. She quotes him, it is Satan's object from one quarrel to make an infinite number, to kindle wrath, to divide the church into factions, to store up sedition, to set up tyrannies, and a word he is plotting no less than general conflagration and destruction. Now, at this stage, I think it should be clear that Satan invented Twitter. <laughs> and I think that although, thankfully, we live in less bloody times uh, in, in Europe, there is a similar attitude of um, intolerance and mutual recrimination um, that we see in a number of um, examples. So inevitably, that brings me to the parable of the gay cake, um, which I would like to describe as a satanic parable um, in a council of terms, which seems to have a, 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 a particularly to, to be read in a way that makes people worse um, rather than better. Both sides have assumed the worst of the others and taken on an extremely shrill and intolerant tone. I certainly think it's a mistake for us to, to, to think that secular values, um, um, things like equality legislation, have the character of religious writ 
But I think that does seem to be a, a, an element that, that it's not, I completely agree that we shouldn't isolate religion from other forms of, um, of tolerance and other, other kinds of ideas. Similarly, some of the, 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 the Christians are not, um, responding to, to, to this have um, had great glee in taking on the mantle of being persecuted and, and talking about how awful um, uh, these secular activists are. And I, I, I do think that, um, that, there's a, that there's a lack of um, moderation and toleration on, on both sides of that. For those who are not familiar, there have been actually a number of examples but of uh, um, a, a gay couple is going to a baker asking them to bake a cake um, with, that celebrates um, gay marriage. Um, this I think, was in Ireland. Yeah, in Northern Ireland, um, yeah. And the, the, the baker says, no, I'm a Christian, I don't believe in homosexuality, I don't want to do that. Um, and so equality legislation was invoked to say that they can't discriminate on that basis. So I hope that's clear for anyone um, who wasn't sure. Um, I do think it was a horrible um, uh, episode that, that, that blew up. Um, Gatti says of, 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 the, of this um, satanic stratagem, the only remedy in a concio's opinion is a return to behavior based on, quote, that excellent reason whereof Satan is not the author, but the Holy Ghost. Um, so reason and appeal to reason, I think that sounds good. Reason coming from the Holy Ghost seems to resolve the whole tension between religion and, and reason, so that's fantastic. But I do think we can secularize that idea by saying that reason has two parts. There's the idea of rationality and there's the idea of reasonableness. Um, is it reasonable to treat people in particular ways? Is it reasonable to use the law to achieve certain ends? Um, and I think often um, in the name of being right um, and, and being dogmatic, um, people can tend to, 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 to let side of, uh, of reasonableness. And what worries me in particular in terms of um, toleration and intolerance is that there's an almost uh, a sense of glee in taking outrage, enjoying being outraged by how horrible um, uh, the, the bigoted Christian baker is or how nasty these, these uh, gay activists and um, persecutors are, um, rather than trying to, to, to relate. And so d d a a a another recent example of that, um, following, given that all religious conflict has now played out um, over bakery, the great British Bake Off, of course, <laughs> um, won by um, a Bangladeshi woman, um, Many of you will come across uh, on social media a, a quote from the Daily Mail um, linking um, this, this woman to the 7-7 the, the, the seven bombers because they were from Leeds and she's from Leeds. So the version I saw, Mike, what have they done? This is, this is nothing beyond them. They had the editorial meeting saying, get this woman, what's wrong with her? Um, think of something, she's from Leeds, that will have to do. Um, <laughs> If you looked further into that um, case, you'd have seen that the article was actually written by that noted Islamophobe, Yasmin Alibi Brown, in fact, <laughs> a, a leading advocate of multiculturalism, um, and it was part of a much larger exploration of how far Muslims have come in multicultural Britain. So the reference to terrorism was obviously there because that's part of the, part of the story. Um, but this episode kind of put me in mind of a, of a quotation from uh, C.S. Lewis, this is my last quotation, um, uh, who, his book had written in 1943 called Christian Behavior. He says, suppose one reads a story of filthy atrocities in the paper. In this case, of course, a filthy atrocity committed by the paper. Then suppose that um, something turns up suggesting that this, the story might not be quite true or not quite so bad as it was made out. If is one's first feeling, thank God, even they aren't so bad as all that. Or is it a feeling of disappointment? or even a determination to cling to the first story for the sheer pleasure of thinking your enemies as, are as bad as possible. If it is the second, then it is, I am afraid, the first step in a process which, if followed to the end, will make us into devils. It's a critique of intolerance, not from the point of view of those who are not being tolerated, but for what it does to those who are intolerant. And it seems to me it's not only a problem when it leads to, to censorship or censorship um, for ourselves or anyone else, but it also has a tendency, particularly when we cultivate intolerance, whether that's in the name of religion or in the name of secularism or anything else, there's a tendency to narrow the mind and blind us to possibilities beyond what we might have thought of before. So from that point of view, I think toleration is an important uh, characteristic to develop as well as an important um, uh, principle for a free society. I sometimes think baking is the new national religion in Britain. Um, and I'm glad, uh, I'm glad that the, the British Bake Off has been brought up because I think both the media reaction, both on the right and on the left, the fawning over the, the British Muslim woman that, that won um, British Bake Off, I think was an indication, is an indication 
of the reductive way that Islam um, is portrayed in the press in Britain. That leads me on to my four points in a kind of response to this question. Have we lost the faith in religious tolerance? Coming in the year of Charlie Hebdo, um, I could make wide-ranging abstract comments about the nature of religious tolerance, what the ideal should be, and what and how we can get there. But I'm a historian, I deal in dead people, and my chief interest is the absolute, well, Britain's experience of religious toleration, particularly over the last 100 years. So my four points, two of which are about the present, and two of which are about the past. The first thing I want to say is that history is important cannot understand how Britain currently deals with religious tolerance or misdeals with religious tolerance unless you understand particularly its history with dealing with immigrants, whether it be Jewish immigration, um, non-conformity, uh, Muslim immigration in the post-Second uh, post World War. There have been waves of religious tolerance over the last 200 years. Um, and there's parallels, but there are also differences. The other issue is the role of the Church of England. We have a state church, and that has had, as an institution, incredible influence, undue influence to a certain extent, on how the British state deals with religious tolerance. The second thing I want to mark out is Britain's unique model of multiculturalism, and that was very much shaped by um, our battles with racial discrimination in the 1970s and 80s. The third point I want to say is we are currently living in an age of hypocrisy and offence. Everyone's in uproar, everyone's offended by each other, everyone's perennially, um, you know, venting their frustrations on Twitter. Um, and it's partly a product of the information revolution. We can show that we're offended, um, and we do, and we enjoy voicing our, uh, you know, the ways in which we are offended by each other. Um, but paradoxically, I think that there is this strange thing that's happening at the moment um, whereby, although we talk about religion more, we understand it less. Um, and I, I just wanted to sort of um, offer some concluding thoughts on that. So my first point, really, is what's unique about the British experience when it comes to religious tolerance? Well, the first thing is we've had a religious war on our doorstep in Northern Ireland um, for the last, you know, well, if we're going to go right back, for the last 500 years. And Ireland, particularly Northern Ireland, has been a model um, that the British state has used over the last, since 2000 and, um, ele uh, 2001 on how to deal with religious tolerance. So the Incitement to Religious Hatred Act, for example, was basically taken from um, the Religious Hatred Bill that was passed in Northern Ireland. So we are, and have done, the British state, use Northern Ireland as a model in how to deal with Islamic extremism in Britain. So the context of Northern Ireland is incredibly important. The second thing I want to say is the role of the Church of England. Britain has gone from, since the 17th century, an established church which enforced religious uniformity. When the nonconformists were given um, recognition, it was only in accordance and acceptance with the Church of England. When the Catholics were given recognition in 1829 with the Catholic Emancipation Act, it was only in accordance and in agreement with the Church of England. When the Satanic Verses controversy happened in 1988-89 and the Islamic community were calling for an extension of the Blasphemy Act to try Salman Rushdie for blasphemy, who supported them? The Archbishop of Canterbury, head of the Church of England. Do not be fooled when we think Britain is a secular country. It is not a secular country. We have an established church with 26 bishops, um, all men, soon to be one woman, in the House of Lords. So we are not a secular country. The move from a Christian country to a multi-faith one has been with the explicit endorsement of the Church of England. Um, and that is a very unique British experience. It's very different from what happens in America, which has a secular state but a devout public. We have a Christian state, but a largely secular, religiously plural 
um, public. France has a very different tradition. It has, because of the legacy of the rev revolution, the history of anti-clericalism, a very entrenched, deeply entrenched secular culture, which of course conditions um, and has conditions its, its response to religious tolerance or intolerance, depending on how you see it. And when it came to multiculturalism in Britain, really through a series of acts in the 1960s and 70s, the Race Relations Act was one of them, one of many, which aimed to outlaw racial discrimination. It did not address the issue of religious discrimination. Britain's model of multiculturalism was secular was inherently secular. And one of the reasons why it was inherently secular is because the move towards multiculturalism was chiefly in this country pushed by black groups that were really calling out for racial equality. The idea of religious equality or religious tolerance was fundamentally ignored until the Satanic Verses controversy, which was the first moment when British Muslims started to air their views, started to, um, whether it was book burning as in Bradford or trying to try Salman Rushdie under the Blasphemy Act, that was the moment. Wasn't 2011, wasn't 7-7. This has a much longer history. And what's interesting, or perhaps worrying, is where we are now. Because having ignored the issue of religious tolerance, created a model of multiculturalism that didn't recognise um, religious diversity, we have gone the other extreme. Um, and I said earlier on, have looked to Northern Ireland as a way of how to deal with um, religious diversity. Now, I'm sure you would probably agree, Northern Ireland isn't my idea of a strictly harmonious um, society whereby religions get along. One of the, the worrying things of the series of um, incessant legislation that has been passed through mostly by the Labour government, but probably by the Conservative government as well, is this attempt to monitor people's thoughts, attempt to regulate how people are dealt with. Um, you know, we are now hearing of university campuses being spied on, um, school teachers having to check you know, a bit like for measles, but for, for radicalization on their students. Um, you know, and the way in which we are now getting to the point where in a strange sort of paradoxical situation where we have sought to create a multi-faith tolerant society and in fact have created, I think, somewhat complete opposite. And that's it. I'm going to stop. Thank you. Very perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Father Christopher. As the only overtly religious person, I don't know about the other personal views of it, but I'm an overtly religious person, I think I'm here as the sign of the religious tolerance of the Institute of Ideas. <laughs> I'm very grateful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tolerance, an interesting word. Um, we use it to talk about drugs and things, don't we, that, that some people have a tolerance for things or an intolerance for, for milk products or whatever. It's the ability to carry something unpleasant in our system. So I have a problem with the idea of tolerating religion. <laughs> the notion that we have to tolerate this unpleasant thing in our system is, I think, part of what makes this a very difficult debate. So um, the notion of tolerating religion, it seems to me, comes from a, not simply a secular, but a secularizing movement. So secular means we want a neutral space, and secularizing means we want to make sure that religion does not have a voice in that public space. So I, I think that somehow we have to move. We wouldn't be happy with something called a race tolerance board, would we? I think we prefer having a race relations board. And I think we need to move towards uh, religious relations as what we're trying to do. But the problem with this is we've had an awful lot about historical narratives and something. So let me give my little bit of historical narrative here. It seems to me the narrative of the 19th and early 20th centuries has been to do with a story that believes that as people become better educated, religion will decline. Now, while that's evidently been the case in much of Europe, it's not evidently the case around the world. And I think that the survival of religion and indeed the growth of religious convictions around the world is one of the problems that secular societies don't know how to deal with. What I believe, though, is that the Catholic Church in Britain, and I accept what Eliza was saying about the role of um, uh, the Anglican Church in this regard, which I think is actually has been a very positive one, 
that the, the role, the way that Britain accepted Catholics into full relationships in this country is actually a really interesting model and something I think Britain should be proud of and for which the Catholic Church is profoundly grateful. Just to remind you that when he was put on trial in the 19th century for libel, John Henry Newman, described by, by um, the Prime Minister Gladstone as the finest mind in Britain, but when he was put on trial for libel, a High Court judge directed the jury that Mr. Newman's testimony was not necessarily to be believed because he was a Catholic priest. That's astonishing to think that that could be said by a judge in a court at that time. How far we've come now is remarkable. And perhaps the key to it has been the 1944 Education Act, which has survived for 70 years and served this country well of having religious communities able to run schools funded by the state. Now, this is anathema to secularizing uh, people in this country, but I want to put it to you that it's actually been the key to the integration of not only a Catholic but other communities as well. To have state funding of religious community schools produces a balance of preserving the identity of that religious community while at the same time enabling the government to be present there to actually have an influence over how it's run. And that balance has worked well. It's worth remembering that the so-called Trojan Hall schools in Birmingham were not religious schools. They were Birmingham City Council schools with no religious presence at the formal level, but there was an attempt by some groups undoubtedly to seize control of those schools. But I believe if they'd actually been properly constituted faith schools, that'd be much harder to happen. Of course, you can't guarantee it, but it's much harder, it seems to me, for it to happen. Similarly, the schools in Tower Hamlets that were criticized, apart from one poor Church of England school that I think was rather badly treated, the Tower Hamlets schools that were criticized were all independent. They were tiny schools run on a shoestring and run very badly, but they were actually pumping out some pretty unpleasant stuff to the pupils, but they were independent. State-funded religious schools, contrary to the secularizing narrative, it seems to me a very positive way to build religious relationships rather than just seeing religion as something unpleasant that we tolerate in the system. We're gonna have to get used to the, pre to the continuing presence of religious groups in our society, Let's make sure that we build positive relations and see that actually schools is one of the best way to do that, reaching parents and students alike. Let's have not religious tolerance, but religious relations. Thank you. And can we thank all our panel? <clears throat> right, to tolerate or not to tolerate Yeah, I've got a question for Eliza. Eliza, you were mentioning this, this whole clampdown by the government on university campuses and uh, schools, etc., looking at what's in people's bags. I mean, the fact is that there are some people within the country who go around beheading us on the street in the name of um, uh, the religion they, they purport to uh, believe in and blowing us up on the tube. And uh, they don't suddenly just wake up in the morning and decide to blow us up on the tube. So what would you do to address um, the ideology that they, that they get inculcated with? Two related points. Firstly, on Humeria's point, that uh, the, the, the European subcontinent, as you described, is, is, is homogenous and lacks diversity. I'd remind you that in London, 30% of the people who live in this city were born in countries outside the United Kingdom. We're in one of the most diverse environments in the world. And I think that the quote about the religious tolerance that you took from the Sunday Times is only one part of the story. The big story today, the headline news on the BBC and other outlets, is about the call by the vast majority of Church of England bishops to bring in more people as refugees from Syria, a non-Christian country, and a demand for 30,000 of those people to be treated with complete tolerance in the United Kingdom as an encouragement to the government to take action as a question of moral responsibility. Yes, this is just to, to Dolan. Um, you, you seem to suggest that the legislation being used with the um, gay cake episode, um, you seem to suggest that was regrettable and that perhaps there was another solution that it, it, it shouldn't have gone to court. But isn't, isn't it the case that it, 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 it is that? It's the, it's the attrition between 
these views and, and wide-scale secular politics and secular and, and reason that has made religions a lot more able to, to live with over, the, over time. And if we deny religions of the attrition between secular, secular reasoning and, 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 and the common view, then we're going to deprive them of the opportunity to change and, and reform. Because, I mean, the, the sweet mediocrity of the Anglican faith hasn't become benign because um, it's changed itself. It's changed because of that, um, that, that attrition with, with, with um, secular views. Thanks. Well, it was really more to share an experience I had earlier in the year when I met uh, a Muslim who had become totally radicalised, and he was an emigre into this country, a highly intelligent professional person. And over a period of years, he had completely evolved into a um, fanatical ISIS state supporter who thought that if he lived in France, it would be his moral duty to murder the Charlie Hebdo cartoonist. And he told me this, and he meant it. I mean, he was not mucking around. We had a very serious discussion over a period of, you know, a couple of hours. And um, I found it really scary. Now, this particular individual had decided that Western society in Britain was so unacceptably corrupt that he was emigrating, and I thought, good, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> going far away. Um, but what on earth do you do about people who have adopted that worldview? You know, that is actually something that I think we should not be tolerating. We should not be required to tolerate people who have actually absorbed that viewpoint in the name of religion or indeed in the name of any other ideology. Uh, and I don't know what you do about it. So I just thought I'd put that out there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, on the point about tolerance meaning uh, that you abide an unpleasant thing, that was the meaning of tolerance before the 1600s, I think, when there were periods of tolerance in Rome or the Edict de Nantes, that's what it meant. It basically meant we have to put up with these people because we're not strong enough to take them on at the moment. We're going to put up with them. In the 1600s, you had a new idea of tolerance, which was a positive one, which is through tolerating the other, through the exchange with the, with the other, I actually det det determine my own view. I develop myself. And there was an idea, actually, of, of the positive virtue of of tolerance in the public sphere. And that was the first point at which the idea that truth actually came from the quarrels of thinkers and, and the conflict of belief, rather than actually truth being, being known in a kind of preordained uh, manner held by the state. Truth was derived from that, that property, and the development of the individual was derived from, from, from that kind of conflict. So I think the, the 1600 idea of tolerance is a possibly positive thing. Um, uh, as opposed to the, the idea before that. I think we need to rediscover that and also rediscover the idea of conscience. I think in many cases these kind of battles of religious conflict, in appearance the passions are high, everyone's shouting, you think, oh, they must really believe what they're talking about if they're shouting so much. But actually I think it's the opposite. They don't actually believe that much. Their religion has no actual inner founding. If it did, they wouldn't be so ruffled and they wouldn't define themselves so totally against opposing points of view, you wouldn't actually have people looking for religious bakers to ask them to bake a gay cake, and you wouldn't have the opposite happening, actually, uh, Christians going to secular bakers to ask them to bake burn fags cakes. So on both sides, it, it suggests a fragility of, of one's inner beliefs, and that's why you actually, people are shouting so much, because they don't actually have that, um, that kind of inner grounding in terms of, you know, kind of, like one Muslim said after the Charlie Hebdo attacks, he said, why would I care what some idiot artists are, are, draw, are drawing in France? You know, if you were actually grounded in your religion, you wouldn't have been so upset. And in a way, the kind of, the, the, the reaction was in part the fragility of, of the grounding in, in, in Muslim communities. Well, let me bring the panel back in and maybe, Eliza, could we, you know, that sort of resonates with your point about um, the age of offense and hypocrisy, Josie's point about this shrill screeching. Could you, Maybe your thoughts on that or anything else? I mean, I'd just like to sort of commend what the lady up, up uh, near the top said um, just now about this sort of 16th century meaning of tolerance and sort of being a sort of basically an intellectual dialogue and the sort of evolution of one's identity through dialogue and exchange with the other. Um, and I think that that's the kind of tolerance I certainly believe in. Um, as to the issue of um, how do you deal with... Um, people who have been um, radicalised and do hold um, radical views. Um, I adhere to the harm principle. You know, I don't believe that it should be the state's role to enforce, regulate what people think, or say, for that matter. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sure um, 
that there are people in this room that disagree with that, but that's personally my view. Obviously, when that reaches a point where those views, you know, forces them to harm others, um, then that's when I think that the state should step in. Um, but I think that we're, we're getting to a situation now where you are in danger of creating um, a victim mentality amongst Muslims or marginalised Christians who feel that they cannot express their beliefs, whether it be on homosexuality or, or other issues, incendiary issues that threaten polite secular liberal values, um, which we are all supposed to adhere. And I think that you know, society and all its wonderful, messy complications is about um, living um, with people that we disagree with. And I think that that, um, through tolerance, uh, well, that can be achieved through tolerance. And I think that. In the era of Twitter, I do think Twitter is a response to rather than has created this sort of reductive um, analysis that we now we now give to things, this instant reaction to things. And I think that, you know, I, I really did not see the point of, you know, everyone changing their, their you know, everyone sort of saying, you know, hashtag je suis Charlie. I, I, I found the whole thing actually gratuitous and awful, the response to that um, horrific massacre and very very reductive analysis and I don't think has led to a greater sense of tolerance or, um, or, or even knowledge about where these people are coming from that, are, that, yeah. that commit such atrocities. Amira, is there anything you'd like to throw in at this stage? So actually, uh, first to go to the question of uh, you know, London's diversity and in fact why I call Europe a subcontinent, um, I often start classes with a map of the world uh, where it's quite clear that geographically, Europe is a subcontinent of Asia in the sense that it's not a separate landmass. Um, so why do we have this idea of Europe as a continent? This is quite important because it's linked to a colonial past where Europe is imagined as this unique place where uh, it's, at, you know, it's at the center of the world, history begins from Europe, theory begins from Europe, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why I insist on, first of all, the question of diversity is that actually you, London now has a certain amount of diversity that other parts of the world have been living. So South America, Africa, uh, other parts of Asia, the number of uh, ethnic, linguistic, religious diversity that has just been a fabric of everyday life in these parts of the world is phenomenal. And what we had in the European context was a homogenization of the imagination. So obviously, Scots and Irish and Welsh and et cetera, all of these, as well as the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians of different colors, as well as the uh, African uh, slaves, et cetera, it wasn't as if they weren't present in Europe. It was just that they weren't recognized as being European. They weren't imagined as part of Europe. So of course, Europe is, a, is, is an imaginative construction. Like, so it's not a continent. It's not, it wasn't, it was never not completely diverse, but that diversity was imagined out. And now we have this process, especially post Second World War in, where with you know, visible immigration, but also with the nationalist sentiment in Scotland and Wales, et cetera, we have had, certainly in the British context, we have had actually much more diversity visible in the public sphere that is demanding certain recognition and rights for it. So, uh, so at the background of all of our conversations is the question of Islam. You know, why are we discussing religious tolerance today? Is because for the last 30 odd years, we have been engaged in what is called a civilizational war. And, you know, people like Huntington call this a civilizational war. We have been engaged in this war on terror or war of terror, you know, depending upon what your perspective is. But this is a, a war that has been framed in religious terms. And this is a war uh, which I think it's important for us to kind of break apart in some ways. There is an aspect of religious language and vocabulary and ideology on, on both sides of the war, but it is not a war in the sense that it is free of material interests. It's not a war that is free of territorial and uh, oil-related interests, etc. So to actually assume this to be only and to fall into and fall 
uh, without complication into the language of a religious war is obviously not just simplistic, it is dangerous. And why do I say that it's dangerous? And, and why do I say that you know, we have to move beyond the discussion beyond tolerance is because precisely, let's take Charlie Hebdo, let's take you know, the gentleman that you mentioned who, um, th who was willing to kill. Let's take Ireland um, uh, and the Irish and other mm -hmm. Protestant and Catholic uh, fights that have been going on there for, well, 500 years now. Are they only religious? Is it only that uh, there is, people are driven by fanatical ideas of, of wanting to follow certain process, uh, a certain idea to a logical conclusion? Or is it that their social and political conditions create certain <clears throat> environments where they are more susceptible to particular kinds of arguments and debates? Okay. So if we divorce these from questions of justice, then tolerance means nothing, as, as uh, has been pointed out. You know, it's awful being tolerated. Who wants to be tolerated? Who wants to be set aside as this person who's somehow nasty mm. but is just being Oh, I don't, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if, if I wasn't tolerated, I wouldn't get much of a look in on, on, on anything. It, 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 can, it can have its virtues for, for, it for, virtues, for, some, yes. for, some, for some people, at least. Let, let, let me bring in Father Christopher and then um, over to you, Leisure. I think that, that we're getting to the heart of it here. <clears throat> and and the, the challenge of the two people, one, about the fundamentalists trying to blow us up and your meeting this person and so on. Um, I think what it comes down to is the, is the human education and formation of human beings. And it's, it's not to do with religion a, a, as a distinct category. It's something to do with how do we have a society that forms people uh, in a way which is frankly beyond not doing harm to others. I'm, I'm not at all convinced that, uh, that saying that Provided you don't harm to others, it's fine, because what is harm and who are the others are two very difficult questions to answer in this context. Because if I think that your society is rotten, um, then you are all being harmed by it, and it's my job to bring it to an end. Somehow we have to um, create a common narrative, and I come back to education. I think it's really significant that there is an entire department now within Manchester University called the Jubilee Centre that is promoting virtue as a key part of um, British education. And if we're looking for British values, God help us, I'm not sure I'm a great fan of British values, but if we're looking at values for, the, for creating uh, human beings who can live well together, I do think that prudence and temperance, justice and courage are four key virtues that could actually form the basis of a very good education system. And it gets us beyond the notion of you've got to be tolerant of a person provided they do harm to others. Let's actually be more ambitious and say we want to form human beings uh, who have qualities such as that. And if you want to add faith, hope, and charity as three other virtues, you can. Mm -hmm. but the, the, what I think is, is really important, though, is this is about human beings, not just about religious communities getting out of control. There's something which is a bigger challenge okay, for our education okay, system. Okay. So, Vesha, do, you, do, do, do you sort of go along with that, that sort of view, or do you think you'd give people more, more latitude to be how they want to be? I could not agree less with Father Christopher, and uh, I'm very glad that I didn't get any questions. I can't blame the audience because it seemed I simply forgot my speech in the middle of it, but uh, never mind. Uh, two important issues. Uh, first, the uh, I would defend the negative tolerance, the meaning of the negative, uh, negative freedom. So that if, if you look at the history of the world, the capitalism succeeded over socialism, and I come from the post-socialist country, because it did not expect too much from the human being. It actually embraced it, its uh, vices, not its virtues. And it simply started, and it simply works. And so if you, uh, we have more and more problems with, well, with the tolerance, with the hate speech, and so on, because instead of uh, keeping tolerance for what it used to be, so simply not agreeing with everything that has been said on the panel here. Uh, I mean, you're sitting here, you don't have to agree with everything, but you are not throwing rocks at us, and you are not disrupting it actively. And this is tolerance, not saying that uh, I agree completely w uh, with whatever has been said here. And if we start, if we start to push people into agreeing, accepting, and embracing everything that other human beings, uh, you know, six billion of them, are, are saying and thinking, then we are demanding the impossible. Then 
they start to revolt. And then we want to use the kind of uh, social engineering to project the society where everyone agrees with everyone and there is no controversy. And honestly, this is a very boring society to live in. And I wouldn't like to live in such a boring, there will be homogeneous, uh, non, uh, uh, non attacking anyone, uh, not multicultural, but really no cultural society. So it's the first point. And the second point about, uh, about secularization and secularizing, because uh, it is not, you know, uh, it's not like converting people to be atheists. This is a completely different thing. It is uh, offering a level ground, uh, it's like a levering the, uh, leveling the ground. So uh, there is no preference to any kind of either religion or any kind of ideology. And so if you turn, what happened in my country, turn after 18, 1989, turn from actively uh, active atheization, uh, secularizing uh, uh, people by force, into actively pushing the Catholic, uh, Catholic rights through the parliament. And the last point, uh, uh, the last sentence, uh, this is not that uh, Secularism is uh, defending us against religion, and religion is something, is something terrible. It is that it simply provides us with the means to defend individual from, uh, from the majority. This is what Alexis Tocqueville said, uh, described as a dictatorship of the majority. We need liberalism and secularism, which is uh, what's liberalism in, in terms of its approach to religion. Okay. So, uh, perfect, perfect. To take the cake again. I do think it's regrettable that, that equality legislation is used to, to coerce people in, in, in those circumstances. I think ultimately it's just unreasonable to use the coercive power of the state to force someone to make a cake or to drive them out of business if they want. It just doesn't meet my standard of, of reasonableness. Um, obviously, it's not a nice thing that, 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 that the, 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 baker, the baker refuses. Maybe there's a bit of unpleasantness. The attrition you're talking about, though, doesn't have to be legalistic. It can just simply be people objecting and saying, don't go to that baker, he's horrible. Um, and that may, that may, may or may not persuade um, fellow citizens. So I think there does need to be a basic level of citizenship. You, know, you can engage in society, you're allowed to, to buy and sell without necessarily buying into a rich set of values. So I, I like the idea of a common narrative, certainly, but I don't think it can be enforced by the law. It needs to be persuasive. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think the state should be in the business of, of, of wearing a, a war of attrition against religion. I mean, religion just to en en engage with the world as, as it finds it. it. Just one thing that occurs to me is we did a Battle of Ideas satellite event in Derby um, a few weeks ago where we discussed this, and it was a bit like a joke because we had a, a Christian speaker, a Muslim speaker, a Jewish speaker, and of course the, 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 the gay kick came up. And the, the cleverest answer, I think, was um, given by the, the Muslim guy who said that if he was the baker, he would have made the cake with whatever slogan they wanted on it, but he would have also taken the opportunity to proselytize for Islam. Um, <laughs> he didn't necessarily mean going on about homosexuality, because I'm, I'm sure there's quite a lot more to Islam than, than what it says about homosexuality. Um, but actually, I think that there's something to be said for that kind of um, level of engagement. You can't expect religion to go away. Um, religions don't really seem to do very much proselytizing at the moment, any religions, which I think is an interesting um, characteristic of, of the time. But I think they're entitled to be part of a conversation about a common narrative, but just as they're not allowed to use coercion to force anyone else to believe what they believe, neither is a secular society. I think that the, the, uh, hum, what Dr. Humerio was saying uh, is fascinating, but I think that in many ways the reaction to the Enlightenment was about the elevation of cultures and particularism. And in many ways, I think the idea of tolerance and toleration is a, a sense of something universal. And I think one of the problems is, to Father's point, about maybe we should have religious relations. I think the, the problem from what happened with Salman Rushdie onwards about race relations and that idea of difference and elevating difference and cultural difference means that the idea that we can all communicate uh, in a universal way and tolerate one another but still say things that are really offensive and outrageous gets diminished. If we all have to respect our difference of one another rather than saying, I'll tolerate that view, but actually I think it's very problematic and I'm going to try and tear it apart. You can do it in a civil way. You can say why you think it's unreasonable and ridiculous and backward, but we can do it in a sensible fashion. And it seems to me that that's what's lost in this, this notion of respecting cultural difference alongside taking offence when anyone says anything to you. And we should, in a very uh, reasonable way, try and promote to everyone how we should be tolerant but not respectful uh, and be able to expose ideas that we think are flawed with the light of reason. Thanks. I just want to echo something that um, Christopher said, which is very important, which is that we need some notion of harm to get this debate going. 
preferably a notion that all parties can agree to. Because the problem with the, the sort of familiar John Stuart Mill principle that everyone, you should be free to say what you want or do what you want as long as you don't harm others is that nobody's going to agree in time on what constitutes harm. So supposing you're debating pornography, suppose you say, if you, can, if you can prove that pornography doesn't cause people to commit crimes or to have antisocial attitudes, it should be tolerated. Because some people will say, that's not the fundamental harm of it. The fundamental harm of it is to the mind. It, it corrupts the mind or the thoughts of the person watching it. It's got nothing to do with how they might behave. And of course, then you have a debate about whether that's true, and if it's so, whether it's a bad enough harm to, uh, to, uh, to justify it being banned by the state. Similarly with religion, but religion is an additional problem, which is that if part of your religion is to be intolerant towards other religions or no religions, if you regard that as a part of your creed to, to fight others, not just debate them, then of course you either you have to say, let's tolerate that, in which case you've weakened the overall case for tolerance, or you say, oh no, we're not going to tolerate your religion if your religion requires you to be intolerant, in which case you, 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 you can't tolerate religion entirely. You just have to hope that religious people aren't too fervent about their religions, or at least they, that they, aren't too, uh, they don't have religions that require intolerance. What's really interesting is whether you can weave tolerance into a proper religious attitude. I hope you can, because you can always argue God is only pleased by free worship. That's one familiar argument, but um, it's fra that idea is fragile at the moment. I think sometimes that tolerance can be very one-sided. I'm, I'm a member of the, the, the Church of England. I like to think that I'm quite a tolerant person. But not so long ago, I was walking down New Street in Birmingham and I saw a sort of, as they put up stalls to sort of promote various religions, etc. And there was this um, man there in the white robe and a big black beard who was um, missionising, obviously. And underneath, on his stall, was a big banner and this banner said, Jesus is Allah's slave. Now, that really upset me because I'm a Christian. But I wonder if that banner had said the opposite. Allah is Jesus' slave. It would have still been there in New Street on that busy day mm -hmm. when I was there. Can we just also sort of think about this? There are a few notions of tolerance being discussed uh, in the last contributions, and it would be useful to try and come to some kind of view of it. I mean, my, my own thought is that if tolerance is virtue, it would seem that in relationship to the question of harm, that you'd try and put up with as much of anything you didn't like as you could. I mean, if you really believe in the virtue of tolerance, uh, you'd just you'd try and take anything. Um, you'd try and allow as much as you could handle of what you didn't like uh, to demonstrate that, that virtue, I suppose. And the reason you might do that was be to show that you recognize uh, the freedom of other people as fully as possible. And I guess the deal is that they might recognize your uh, independence and freedom as fully as possible as, as well. Um, it you know, seems to be a good way of living together, but maybe that's just me. I just want to sort of explore this uh, tolerance and sort of being judgmental and look at the, how the state basically is the arbiter. So, for example, this exchange between Barbara Houston and yourself, Eliza, over when Barbara said, you know, which I think is entirely reasonable for her to say, I hope this nihilistic man who wants, you know, considers ISIS favorable uh, to him to go away as far as possible. Now, obviously that's a very judgmental statement, but I think that's fair enough. But then when she, Barbara said, we, you said, well, I think we, you know, it's unacceptable for the state to decide what we think. Well, w why not let us consider we as civil society as separate from the state? And, and start thinking about how we, can, in civil society, be, can become judgmental and tolerant. There was discussion earlier on in the weekend on liberalism uh, in, in relation to that. How do, how do we uh, consider uh, tolerance in relation to being judgmental? Now, uh, so, and just, for, just another point, just to, on uh, diversity and multiculturalism. We found that we've, we're in a situation in 2015 where the state has divided up society in housing, in, you know, the, the diversity is a policy. So you, uh, the state has actively divided society up. You know, it, it wasn't always the case that people of a particular race lived in a particular area in public housing. You know, it used to be the case where, where it was mixed. Uh, I'll give you an example of Northern Ireland. Protestantism and Catholicism uh, in the early 90s, I knew of a youth centre who got, used to get European funding to take Catholic children and Protestant children out 
into you know outdoor pursuits <coughs> activities and the aim the vision was to unite these children around you know what they had in common this youth center lost its funding in the early 90s because the policy changed it said no no we must respect difference we must respect the catholicism and the protestantism of these children Whilst I agree that Elijah's point that the Harmon Principle should be employed for religious intolerance, since I think it's the most pragmatic way right now to employ religious tolerance, I've discovered a problem with it. I believe the thoughts of, on immoral action can just be, just be as bad as acting upon it. So take, for instance, like homophobia. A lot of people before thought homophobia was acceptable, and sometimes not always acting upon it. I think that's just as bad as the act itself, since I don't know any better. So do you not think... Uh, there's another solution to employ in religious intolerance. So religious mean, tolerance, sorry. Do you mean that we should sort of punish for thought I, crime? I, I'm not really too sure how, <laughs> since it's so damaging, um, the no, effects I mean, it's, it's of, a view. Yeah, because I mean, it's like you know. almost controlling brains. And, yeah. But, it's yeah, do you not think there's another soon. solution that could be implied in the harm principle? Okay, um, good. So everybody with radical and extremist views, make sure you get them in today, because they're going to be banned tomorrow. So, But <laughs> this is a complete free speech zone still, so, so we're going to go. So there's a... Lady, lady there. I would direct uh, the first question to Christopher. When you said about the society to be boring if we tend to tolerate all the differences, um, don't you think that not accepting uh, differences would, be actually, would lead actually to mo a more boring society with everybody believing in the same things? If we do not have Muslims, uh, Jews, uh, Christians, non-believers, like any, any other like, different group, don't you think that society would be boring then? And the next thing uh, I wanted to point at, uh, many examples here have been um, pointed to Charlie Hebdo um, um, yeah, uh, killings, um, and the, uh, nobody actually pointed to how other Muslims as well would relate to such incidents. For example, I come from Egypt, and uh, Great. on Great a very time. sad day, uh, a number of um, uh, Egyptian Christians have been killed by ISIS in Libya, uh, and during that uh, sad video, uh, ISIS have used an anthem uh, which, uh, by which, the, yeah, that played during this uh, process that happened, the killing of the Egyptians. And what Egyptians did afterwards, after very many sad days, uh, Egyptians have created a counter campaign, if we may say. Egyptians have used the same anthem and uh, mixed it with another, uh, let's say, mixing of music and made it danceable so that they make fun of ISIS or, and of what they do in dancing, series of dancing videos where they put on beards, put on this white uh, long uh, jalabiya, and they were dancing on this anthem to prove to them that we're not afraid of you, we're not afraid of what you do. I'm a little disappointed they haven't given us really any guidelines as to really the key issue, which was what you started with the Our Sunday Times article. Uh, we've heard a lot of very um, worthy thoughts. But uh, the truth of the matter is, I think, and would you consider that what we're dealing here is not actually a religious uh, issue, but it's actually political Islam? And would it be a useful distinction to say that this is political Islam, very akin actually to our first speaker's reference to Catholicism in the, in the 1400s, 1500s, which was a, 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 a body outside of our national boundaries. That was why it was considered to be a threat. Uh, and so therefore, in the context of political Islam, I consider that probably we are justified in sacrificing some of our rights, uh, or other people's rights probably, uh, in order to... Um, <laughs> keep, keep hold of your own. Well, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, if, if we, uh, as always, if, we, if we're innocent, we don't have anything to hide. Uh, but um, uh, Eliza sort of got so far towards this, but at what point do we say we have to sacrifice somebody's rights because otherwise they're going to go down the road and they're okay. going to chop somebody's head off? Right. And what are we going to say to the parents of those people if we actually knew that there were those radicalised people were going to do that? Okay. May I make a pitch again <laughs> for the idea of justice versus tolerance? Because it links to some of the questions that have been raised. I think that tolerance is a minimal value, uh, and it is a byproduct of other kinds of processes. So if we have a discourse and a mobilization, social mobilization around the question of equality and justice, we are likely to actually fold some of the questions that have been raised here into that. Um, and I want to give a very quick example um, of the US, where in the 1960s, the question of racial equality was a question of equality and justice. 
um, through the 1980s and 1990s, it became a question of tolerance. So the idea that these people are weird, you know, these black people, I don't, they, we don't like what they do, they have some weird habits, etc. but that's okay, we tolerate them. And that today we see again has come back and erupted because tolerance is not the same as equality. And so I want to make a pitch for thinking about tolerance not as a maximal value, but as a minimal value. All right, I, I don't know if I was understood, uh, maybe I didn't make myself clear. What I meant is uh, not to try to uh, make everyone uh, think the same and offer them a kind of appeal from the Aldous Huxley brave new world so they are, well, just acceptable for, 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 for everyone. And, uh, and uh, so it's like kind of taking the alcohol from the, from the beer and, and offering everyone uh, uh, non-alcoholic uh, beverages. Uh, I mean, you can do this, but I don't, I, don't see, I don't see the point of drinking it. And last comment on, on, uh, on the tolerance. Uh, we have the right to be judgmental and politeness when it becomes uh, a law, it's called censorship. So uh, the tolerance is, uh, is to public discourse what boxing rules and gloves are to, um, uh, are to, the, to the fighting. We can, uh, of course, uh, 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 without the rules, without the rules, the public discourse will be impossible. But if we take the punching out, uh, then the boxing becomes meaningless. So, and just one last comment. I think that uh, after the discussion, I see that Britain is waiting for like a remake of American Pie. It's going to be called British Cake, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Dylan. Um, I would just say that toleration is unilateral. It can't be contingent. You can't say, as some American conservatives do, no churches in Saudi, no, no mosques in America until there are churches in Saudi Arabia. No, toleration means if you're a tolerant country, you tolerate uh, whatever. And it, it, it's not about what, what else does to you. We have to tolerate intolerance. That really does need to be tolerated because it's bad, um, if that's clear. Um, and I think, you know, I'm not as, as radical as Jesus who said, turn the other cheek, but I do think we should turn the other ear. Um, if, it's, if there's no... F if <laughs> physical violence involved, then certainly we should, um, uh, we, we, we should be able to treat ideas um, as, as something that, that can always be tolerated, even if we find them very objectionable. And the distinction for me with, with, is not between religious and political Islam, but political Islam can be tolerated as well, as long as it's not violent. It's when people become violent that the, 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 the course part of the state is legitimate. Um, but toleration is, is something that applies to, to ideas and beliefs and to practices as long as they don't harm us. So I do think that's still an important idea. Well, the religion Religion fused with the political is nothing new, and I think it's been going on for centuries and is likely to continue. I think the point about the Church of England getting involved on the refugee crisis is a classic case in point where that's the kind of fusing of religion and politics that this country um, likes um, and can cope with. I think that Islamicism, obviously not. I, one of the things I find increasingly the case is in all religions, there is a clear division between liberals and conservatives. And liberal Catholics, Anglicans, Jews, Muslims get on very well with each other. Conservative um, Anglicans, Jews, Catholics, Muslims get on very well with, with each other. They find that they have a, a real struggle when it comes to actually um, with those within their own faith. And I think that, that that the, the issue we're facing now is that secular liberals can have nice, cosy conversations with liberals um, within um, religious denominations, um, but it's dealing with the difficult and dealing with those that are, are saying things and believe things that people don't find easy to comprehend and, dare I say it, tolerate. One worrying thing is I shared a panel with Katie Hopkins this week, and I, she really put my tolerance to the test, let me tell you. But one thing she did say, I mean, this is a woman that profits from making a, being offensive, right? She has made an awful lot of money. Um, but she has to go in, often when she speaks at university campuses, she, ha, but she does quite a lot. She has to go through a secret entrance. There's all sorts of issues around publicity. Right. The issue, I think, is on university campuses, the curtailing of freedom of speech and the, um, the, 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 the way in which certain opinions are being silenced. Just final thing is thank God, therefore, for the battle of ideas. Thank you. Uh, here, 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 here. Um, well, right, uh, fa Father, it's your last minute. Um, uh, the <laughs> so much for religious tolerance. <laughs> <laughs> Send for a priest. Um, the, the, uh, I think underlying a lot of this debate is the anxiety about Islamism. That's to say the political enforcement of Islamic values, either by election or, but, but very especially by violence. And that Islamism, 
I think, has exposed the weakness of civil society in Britain. I think we have a weak civil society at the moment. I think that civil society needs to be strengthened around a common narrative. And what the battle of ideas is showing is it's a struggle to arrive at that narrative. But I'm going to make a final pitch for saying, I agree with you, Mera, whatever the narrative must be, it must include justice. But I would like to put in a pitch for the two much neglected virtues of prudence and temperance, which I actually think could characterize the debate as somebody said, I absolutely disagree with you. I disagree with you strongly, but we're going to conduct this temperately and prudently. And if we inculcate prudence and temperance, maybe religious tolerance won't be needed. Can we thank our panel and thank, your, thank yourselves? <laughs>